There are plenty of movies meant for kids based on classic stories, but if you dig a little deeper, you'll find some pretty adult themes in the source material. A lot of the movies that we'd happily show a four-year-old have origins dark enough they'd horrify a 40-year-old. Snow White was already a pretty terrifying movie that haunted the nightmares of many a small child when it first debuted in 1937, but believe it or not, the fairy tale it was based on is somehow even scarier. That probably shouldn't be surprising, though. This was a Brothers Grimm original, and those two famous storytellers are well known for loading up their children's stories with way more death and violence than Disney would have you believe. Case in point, in the original Snow White, the evil queen orders a hunter to bring her Snow White's lungs and liver, but the hunter has a conscience, so he brings back the lungs and liver of a boar instead. Then the queen eats the lungs and liver, believing them to be Snow White's organs because she is just that evil. Don't worry though, she gets her punishment in the end. She's forced to wear a pair of iron shoes and dance on hot poles until she dies. Pleasant dreams, kitties! Disney's The Little Mermaid is a beloved classic that kicked off what animation fans call the Disney Renaissance with its heartwarming tale of love, talking fish, and catchy songs about combing your hair with a fork. It's a solid achievement in filmmaking, but it's even more impressive when you consider how horrific the original version of the story actually is. The original story was written by Hans Christian Andersen back in 1837, when parents apparently didn't mind funneling pure nightmare fuel into their children at bedtime. For a start, the Little Mermaid's sisters like to pass the time by luring sailors to their deaths, and also mermaids don't have souls, so if they die, they just disintegrate into the ocean and are gone forever. The prince, who is the subject of our heroine's affection, is patronizing and creepy and doesn't actually marry her in the end. That doesn't sound so bad, since she might be better off without this jerk, but in this version, no marriage means death and disintegration. To save herself, the Little Mermaid could kill the prince, but for some reason she loves the creep, so she refuses. Poor child. Poor sweet child. She has a very serious problem. The good news? She doesn't actually disintegrate. Instead, Anderson doomed her to flying around the world as some weird fairy thing for hundreds of years. Sure, why not? So at some point during the 1990s, some entertainment executive said to a room full of other entertainment executives, Hey, do you know what would make an awesome children's movie? A story about an entire family who gets brutally executed in their own cellar. Okay, so that's probably not how it went down, but how else do you get an animated flick for kids based on the real-life execution of Tsar Nicholas II and his entire family during the Russian Revolution? That's right, we're talking about the 1997 film Anastasia. This wasn't a Disney film, presumably because even Disney knew better than to go anywhere near that storyline. Don Bluth, however, an ex-Disney animation mastermind behind creepy hits like The Secret of Nim and All Dogs Go to Heaven, had no problem diving right in. Of course, even he decided to skip over the whole execution thing, and after that, the story veers off in the same direction as a lot of real-world theories about the fate of Anastasia Romanoff, minus the wizard battle at the end. She survives the Russian Revolution and lives happily ever after with, of course, her one true love. The real story is much more tragic and involves the Romanoff family being held as prisoners in their own home until their captors got worried about a possible rescue attempt and decided to end the bloodline right there. With that in mind, you can forgive the kids' movie for being historically inaccurate on that front, though to be fair, the official records are unclear about whether a singing bat was involved. Like Snow White, Sleeping Beauty is a beloved children's classic featuring a curse, a purely evil antagonist who became one of Disney's most iconic villains, and lots of singing. In the end, the princess marries her one true love because, as we all know, that's the only way princesses can be happy. The original story, Sun, Moon, and Talia, was written in the 1300s, and it hasn't exactly aged well. It's basically a tale of some creepy dude taking advantage of an incapacitated young woman. After Sleeping Beauty is cursed, a king finds the princess alone in a house and he, quote, gathers the first fruits of love, which is a pretty sweet and flowery way of saying that he belongs in prison. Later, the princess, while she's still essentially comatose, gives birth to twins, wakes up, and doesn't seem to think it's weird at all that she has two babies. Then the king's wife, oh yeah, he was already married, tries to eat the princess's babies because the only way to be a bigger villain than the king in the story is straight-up cannibalism. Disney's 1996 adaptation of The Hunchback of Notre Dame might be the all-time champion of ill-fated attempts to transform a tragic story into a heartwarming kids' movie, 
and it still opens with a woman being kicked to death by an evil priest. If that's what they left in, imagine what they had to get rid of to wind up with their version of Quasimodo, a lovable hero who doesn't get the girl, but does win the love and acceptance of the citizens of Paris. Delightful, right? Well, in the original story, Quasimodo falls for the beautiful Esmeralda just like he does in the Disney version, but the evil Frollo kills Esmeralda's true love, Phoebus, and frames Esmeralda for it. Quasimodo bravely tries to save her from the gallows, but alas, this ain't no Disney film. Esmeralda is hanged and Quasimodo is left in abject despair at the end of a romping tale of the social rejection of disabled people. On the bright side, there aren't any talking gargoyles making fart jokes. All right, all right! Pour the wine and cut the cheese! The massive hit Frozen doesn't really resemble the story it was based on, and that's probably a good thing. If it actually had been a faithful adaptation of The Snow Queen, there would have been a lot fewer songs about embracing your potential and a whole lot more scenes of people being stabbed with broken glass. The original story came from Hans Christian Andersen, the same guy who thought that Ariel's family should be a bunch of literally soulless killer fish people. Instead of Elsa and Anna, it features a little girl named Gerda and her best buddy Kai. Unfortunately, when the devil and a bunch of trolls break an evil magic mirror, a shard of it impales Kai and makes it so he can only see the worst in everything. Then, for some nonsensical reason, the boy meets up with the Snow Queen, who is not a lovely blonde ballad-singing lady in a frosty blue dress, but a bearskin-clad enchantress who makes him forget his home and his family. It's not all bad, though. While everyone else thinks Kai's dead, Gerda decides to go after him and eventually finds him nearly frozen in the Snow Queen's castle. When she weeps over him, her love melts his frozen heart and the magic mirror fragments fall out and then they live happily ever after. So yeah, weirdly enough, this is one of the few Disney movies where they actually had to add a scheming murderer who wasn't there in the original. It's pretty weird that the story of a beautiful young woman falling in love with a gigantic angry bear wolf with horns was ever considered appropriate for children, but at least in the Disney version, their relationship never gets any more physical than a waltz around the castle. The original versions of the story, though, and there's more than one, are way more twisted and weird than the one with all the talking furniture, even if you get past Belle's proto-furry romance. The French fairy tale was written in 1756 and includes many tired stereotypes. Beauty is beautiful, her sisters are not, and therefore beauty is also morally superior because everyone knows that physically ugly people can't ever be beautiful on the inside. The story goes down in much the same way as the Disney movie, except that when the Beast lets Beauty go home to visit her family, her sisters try to keep her from going back, not because they love and miss her, but because they're hoping the Beast will become enraged and eat her. In other versions, there are ugly fairies trying to seduce handsome princes, babies getting snatched from their cribs, and troll princesses and pig kings, so yeah, the talking teapots of the Disney story are actually pretty tame. They're still gross, though. The 1967 Disney version of Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Book features singing, dancing monkeys, and a bear wearing a hula skirt. That's some quality children's entertainment right there. The original story was a long way off from the animated version, though. For a start, the characters used archaic language full of thee and thou, just like Shakespeare, which must have baffled many a child reader. The story was also way more violent. In the end, Mowgli skins Shere Khan and brings his hide back to the wolf pack. It wasn't just man-on-tiger violence, either. Mowgli's tutors regularly beat the crap out of him. But that's not the biggest problem with Kipling's jungly tale. Kipling was a British man who was born in colonial India in 1865, so it won't surprise you to learn he had some pretty messed-up ideas about race and wasn't really shy about letting those messed-up ideas slip into his writing. In The Jungle Book, the Indian villagers are portrayed as primitive and superstitious, and he also separately wrote a poem called The White Man's Burden to explain how it was a moral imperative for the United States to take over countries like the Philippines so that they could civilize their residents. So that's lovely. The original Jungle Book doesn't have a happy ending. It's really just depressing. There's no happy meeting with a lovely villager. Mowgli does go back to the human village, but finds he doesn't belong there either, so he ends up doomed to a life in between the worlds of men and beasts, never fully belonging to either. So really the only thing that's the same about Puss in Boots from the 2011 Shrek spinoff and Puss in Boots from the original fairy tale is that it's the story of a cat who wears a feathered hat and walks upright in a pair of shiny leather boots. In the modern version of the story, Puss drinks from saucers of milk at the pub, is frenemies with Humpty Dumpty, tries to steal the goose that lays the golden eggs, and gets tangled up with Jack and Jill, 
who are actually weird thugs who commit crimes while having Tarantino-esque conversations about parenthood. Well, that we cut down on some of the hijacking and murdering. I mean, it's fun and all, but uh, uh, I want a baby. In the original fairy tale, Puss in Boots' owner is an impoverished young man who decides he's going to have to eat his cat and make some clothing out of his skin, so right away we're in some rough territory. The cat, who for some reason can talk and walk upright, would prefer not to be eaten, so instead he offers to help his master improve his situation. But instead of going into the entertainment business as, you know, a walking, talking 17th century Garfield, he instead goes out and lies, cheats, and steals his way through a series of challenges until his master ends up married to a princess. That's how fairy tales always end, except for the ones where everyone dies. So the moral of this story, kids, is that lying will get you everywhere and cheating is a totally acceptable way to get what you want. The end. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.